Hey friends, well, welcome to the fireside. Very happy to have you here. Hey Shaka Bras, hold on, let me fix this. There, mm, no. Hey Shaka Bras, welcome to the fireside. My name is Jake, very excited to have you back here with me today. Uh, we have a great episode for you today with Patrick Paul O'Neill. Sounds like a sitcom name, but he's a tattooer. He's actually a really awesome tattooer out of Toronto. And he's doing some really, really beautiful, uh, large scale, illustrative, Japanese and Chinese inspired tattooing. A very awesome, like subtle color and temperature transitions, muted color palettes, some really, really uh, beautiful work. So if you don't follow him, you definitely should. And I know you'll want to follow him by the end of this episode. We're actually splitting this episode into two parts because the conversation was about two hours long. And um, I know some podcasters do these two and three hour marathon podcasts, but but not me. I like to break them up a little bit because I don't like to listen that long. So we're going to break this one up into two episodes. We go pretty deep on a lot of topic, a lot of topics here. Uh, Patrick is a uh, very thoughtful um, and well-planned type of guest. He likes to think about what he's going to say before he says it. He had a few topics that he really wanted to hit on. And so we did a fair bit of planning before we even recorded the episode, which turned out to be great. Uh, he shares a lot of interesting stories and analogies. He's done some really interesting things in his fairly short career. I think he's only been tattooing maybe 10 years or so and uh, uh, and is really accomplished, especially for that period of time that he's been working. Uh, but um, yeah, I think you're really gonna enjoy this episode. I had a blast recording it. Thank you as always for supporting what we do and let's get to the episode. I suppose the first thing that kind of comes out that I, sh I should bother bringing to mind is um, I had like a, a pretty typical experience in like, you know, an arts education stream in North America, um, of which I find there from my conversations to be uh, some pretty big differences if you were to compare it to perhaps what you're seeing abroad. Um, in terms of like what what does an art education kind of mean? Um, in my case, it was you know high school classes uh, where you're you know you're being taught to paint portraits with like you know skin tone paint, and then a tube of black and a tube of white, um, and then you're told oh you can actually go to university for this you can you can get a degree in art, um, and so that that kind of had me locked on uh, the Ontario College of Art and Design, which is one of the bigger art schools um, here in Toronto, uh, Canada. Um, and I think like I would describe it perhaps from my ignorance as like a, like a post-modernist art school. I don't really know if there's like a, a term, I, I don't really know if there's a term to describe what art schools are like now, but um, that's at least how it's been described to me. Um, so what would be some example, like, what, what do you think makes it that was, was it not rooted in a lot of classical, like traditional drawing techniques? Was it more, I had, I had a, a, an art school education that I don't know how I would characterize it, but I felt like the majority of my instructors were heavily influenced more by like abstract expressionism and more modern, you know, 20th century artists rather than say, um, you know, classical art, uh, or, yeah. Yeah, it's, I'd say that it's a, it's a pretty similar, um, my experience is pretty similar to yours where, you know, if you, uh, if you want to show one of your professors like, hey, this is JC Leindecker, like, what do you think of this guy? And like, ah, he's a bit corny, that kind of stuff. Where, right. um, and, and I also, you know, I don't want to be, you know, ragging on, on those types of art schools. I think that they're trying to do a very specific thing. I think that they're gearing fine artists for what the, the contemporary fine art world is, which in, in reality you know, you don't need to learn to draw the figure. You don't need to learn perspective. So they're, they're actually kind of doing their job. Um, I think it's more art colleges such as like Sheridan, um, like Sheridan here in Toronto is a, a great example. Or um, like I've had, there's so many schools that you guys have in the States, um, which seem to have like much more of a, uh, of an educational approach that's rooted in learning like the fundamentals of like two dimensional graphic design. Um, so I, I'd say that I, I, I tried to do the best with what I had while I was there. I, I think that whereas like the, the actual program itself didn't really give me what I was looking for, the students that did identify those things as values that they want to learn, you know, we naturally just kind of clung around and we, we would learn off of each other. Um, and it's, it's not too different of a scenario as, uh, as when you're in a, t in a tattoo studio, right? Um, or you're, you're just bouncing ideas off of each other as opposed to sometimes just having like a specific mentor. Um, 
so that being said, um, you know, my, my plans of becoming a painter kind of changed after a while. I had a focus primarily on realism, um, not necessarily as an end goal, but just as a means to try to learn new things um, and try to get like more tools in my tool belt, I guess you could say, to then go on and do whatever illustrative stuff I want down the road um, and still have like a solid uh, foundation. Um, kind of where I started to fall out of love with it was later on in the years when, you know, I'd go to a lot of art gallery shows and, and I'm not saying this is the truth. This is just how I kind of felt about it is that it, it felt like it was a lot of networking to try to get deals out of people. Um, it, a lot of the genu the conversations, uh, I suspected were a bit disingenuous, but again, I don't know if that's the truth. That may have just been like my insecurities at the time showing, but either way, I, I, I kind of stopped identifying that as like, oh, that's what I want to do. That's the path that I, that I kind of want to go down on. Um, I don't have an ability to do small talk very easily. Um, and I, I, you know, if I'm, if I'm talking to someone and I know that I'm trying to get something out of them, I get really anxious. I get really flustered and it, you know, it doesn't really go anywhere. Uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't be a, like a good salesman, I think. Um, and so one day my, I was, you know, talking to my buddy Kevin and he had this, uh, this amazing dragon tattoo. And, and at that point I, you know, I had a couple tattoos in my hometown, but I, I didn't really think of it as a, as a option, uh, as a career. Um, my experience getting tattooed when I was, you know, 19 was like a kind of a, a questionable character in your hometown, uh, who does like, ah, I can do that for 400 bucks. And so for me, I'm thinking, oh, I just got to sell some video games and I can, I can get this tattoo, right? Um, that was what I thought tattooing was. That's who I thought the crowd was. Uh, and so uh, my buddy Kevin had this amazing dragon, Kevin Compuesto, uh, who is also a big listener of your show. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, Kevin had this incredible uh, dragon. And I said, Kevin, where'd you get that done? And, he's, and I, if I recall correctly, he said that he traveled uh, up to San Francisco to get it. And he was saying, you know, man, though, I, there are some days where I, I consider the possibility of, you know, what if instead I would have waited for, for Tony from, uh, from Chronic? And I didn't know what he was talking about. I was like, what's, like, why, what's, I think your tattoo is great. Like, who's this Tony guy you're talking about? And uh, he had mentioned, oh, he's this guy named Tony who uh, at Chronic King Tattoos here in Toronto. And he does like neo-traditional Asian. And he's kind of taking some of the compositions that you'll see in traditional Japanese, but he's injecting uh, like classical Chinese drawing, uh, kind of into the mix, um, which, you know, I, I think that, you, you know, your familiarity with, uh, with fine art, I think you'll also be able to see that the Chinese traditional model seems to have taken a lot from like the Russian traditional model. So kind of in an interesting way, you have like, you know, uh, Russian realism and it's, and some of its focuses on structure and light, uh, seemingly making its way to China. And then that kind of somehow ending up into these tattoos here in Toronto, Canada. Um, and, you know, at the time I was, you know, in a lot of student debt. Um, and by that point I, you know, I was scrambling. I didn't know, I didn't really know how to sustain myself after I was going to be done my career. Um, and meanwhile, he's telling me this Tony guy, he's, you know, he's charging this much an hour and he's booked out like this far. And so to me, you know, I didn't get into tattooing or at least my curiosity with tattooing wasn't because, you know, I love tattooing. It wasn't because I was, um, you know, I, I dreamt about this, you know, doing this since I was a kid. No, it was simply, I, you know, I, I was just kind of panicking and I, and I saw this as an interesting, uh, as an interesting idea, but the thing that changed things the most was, um, about a half a year later, when the when the, the memory kind of came back to me, as I opened up Tony's Instagram, saying, "Yeah, let's check out this this Tony guy," and he did this uh, that particular day. He posted a beautiful painting um, of a character from Chinese history, and and this particular character was one that I drew a lot as a kid. And and I thought to myself, like, "Oh wow, those characters that I drew as a kid, this guy's drawing them as his job, and he has really great job security." And I I I kind of just took that as a a really subtle sign, um, not to sound too corny, but like from the universe, like maybe this is something you should check out. So uh, I sent an email off to the shop. You said um, this was months or a year later after the initial conversation? 
I'd say this was a couple a couple months after the, uh, oh, okay. the initial conversation. Um, and so I had sent an email off to the shop. Um, and like looking back at it, I was like, I was so unnecessarily cocky. I was like, yeah, like, you know, I'm i I'm a painter. And th these are like some magazines that I've been in because I thought I had to like, you know, qualify myself, things like that. And, uh, and I sent them some pictures of my work and I guess, you know, my boss uh, liked my attitude or at least he found it funny. So he called me in for an interview. Um, and yeah, it, it went really terrifically. Um, and my, my plans were initially to uh, do color realism. So, so it's, it's been a big change in terms of what I did end up doing where it's where I feel is like a much more like illustrative style influenced yeah. by a lot of Japanese and Chinese tattooing. Yeah, it's a long way from color realism. What 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 caused the shift? Um, for myself, I've always like secretly had a preference, or not a preference, but I've 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 kind of gravitated toward more illustrative work my whole life. Um, that being said, though, I, I think I was also uh, this this might seem a little odd to say. I think I was a little bit of a lazy artist, and I I kind of. Uh, relaxed on the crutch that you know bad realism provides you in terms of impressing people right like you draw anybody in the world can draw a realism eye when you're like 12 or 13 or 14 and it will impress people that you know your your aunt's going to be saying like oh you're the next michelangelo i just know it yeah. um and I, I i i myself like i'm one of those students who um i think i was like just too obsessed with impressing people so i I kind of latched onto realism because it kind of came to me early and the illustrative stuff really stressed me out because I knew that it's not about making some like cartoon. It's like, you really have to understand the forms and you have to like push those forms past what reality can provide you. Like um, Marco Bucci has a great expression, which is that nature is, uh, is under no obligation to give you great shapes. And it's your job as a designer to, to, you know, um, mold them and craft them to the best of your ability to, to make them work. And that's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to do that well. It's pretty yeah. intimidating. I've never, I've never heard that quote before. I, I, I love it though. And there's, it's completely true. That is what's so entertaining to me about it though is having like, you know, have, uh, learning to use reference, you know, effectively. So when you you're like, and I don't really know how to draw that, but I know about the. I know about how it needs to sit and I know kind of the shapes that make it up. So I'll lay that out so that I know kind of what I'm looking for. And then I'll go look for my reference. But the chances that I'm going to find the reference that match this perspective of this character that I'm looking for are really slim. So I'm going to end up having to fake it anyways. <laughs> you know, I'll just get as close as I can with the photo reference. Yeah, it's yeah. it's so funny you mentioned that. Like there's like the, the Pinterest rabbit hole where um, you tell yourself, okay, today I'm doing a rabbit tattoo. So let me find a rabbit. And then you, you know, you might find a, a, a particular reference that has great lighting, but it doesn't have quite the angle that you need. And so you're like, okay, well, let me look for this specific angle. And before you know it, you spend like two hours just accumulating references, which none of them match specifically what you're going for. And you would have just saved yourself some time from watching like a half hour video on rabbit anatomy and <laughs> construct it yourself. Uh, so there's... There's an expression that uh, my wife likes to use, which is that the, like the long path is the short path, mm -hmm. um, and this is that's a great example of it right there, right? Yeah, um, yeah that's what I was. I guess that that's kind of how I, I first kind of got introduced to it. But um, what to answer your question as so to what eventually kind of got me to consider more illustrative work was the immediately after our interview. We uh, we went up to the studio so you can introduce me to some of my my future coworkers, and I saw uh, uh, my one time mentor Tristan's uh, work. Um, he I think he was doing like an hourglass with some snakes coiled around it, and it, and he, I think most people would say that he's doing like very refined neo traditional Asian like it's 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 a very specific look. Um, this, however, didn't necessarily have like uh, any um, Asian uh, subjects, but the style was undeniable and I'd never seen anything like it. And it, it, it stopped me in my tracks in terms of what I felt I wanted to do. Like, so for four years, I had trained myself uh, specifically to learn realism. And then in, a, in an instant, that was gone. 
and I was mesmerized by um, like the relationship and the shapes and like the the, the subtlety to line. And th these were things that I, I wouldn't be able to necessarily approach if I were going to be doing the type of realism that I was doing before. So I was like, all right, it's time to start fresh and actually try to learn something about art as opposed hmm. to just trying to take the easy road, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. So the things that stood out to you weren't necessarily because it, the, the subject matter, but it was just the, the, the technical kind of approach to that neo-traditional style like the arrangement of shapes and in varying edges and line widths or you know what, uh, things like that or what what do you think caught you so drastically well i think at the moment i, I wouldn't have been able to articulate this or like kind of i'm 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 really guessing as to what it was but but my, my best shot would be there seemed to be such a mastery of abstraction in the piece and and what i mean by that is is that like line weight is an inherently like abstract concept um you know shape relationships are are abstract concepts they're it's not as easy as just like having a reference in front of you and like that's the guide no it's like you're you're working with like pure energy at that point if that makes sense and and that to me was just mesmerizing it was it was like hypnotic to see you know this man uh you know dance a marker around a page and you know one quarter of the way through you might not really know where he's going but by the halfway point you're like wait i think there's something that's trying to come out of that page and then by the end of it it's like a fully rendered image that was kind of like hidden there the whole time in his in his eyes and as he's drawing those marks he's just taking away the curtain to let you look at the magic i suppose mm -hmm. yeah 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 that's it's, a, it, it's 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 awesome to look back and and um and like be able to identify those points in time that had a had an impact like that on your like trajectory as an artist or through through your career. I um, I remember the um, the first time there, there were two different uh, instances that that made me feel more confident in what I could be as a tattooer and what tattooing could be in the future. And this was probably in the earlier 2000, let's say 2001 to 2003. And, and I saw um, my first Guy Aitchison tattoo in person. It was a gnarly kind of skull. And, and the approach was so non-traditional, uh, non-traditional from a, you know, traditional tattooing standpoint. Uh, that really caught me because I realized he did not approach tattoos the way that I had been taught to approach tattoos. And then uh, I met Nick Baxter not long after that, and he was talking about tattooing in in layers and laying down, you know, a base layer and then letting it heal. And then he was talking about glazing color and things like that through in tattooing. And I, like you, I had come up in a uh, through art school, and even though I didn't have a, I didn't learn from traditional kind of academic painters. I came I learned from 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 instructors who who really loved, you know, Mark Rothko or Jackson Pollock, or they, they loved a lot of, they didn't take a really traditional approach to painting. I, I had I had been introduced just through my group of friends to traditional, you know, uh, classical approaches to painting. So the idea that that could, might be able to in some way be applied to tattooing just blew my mind. And I hated the idea, the structure of tattooing in my early years, you know, like the get all of your lines in there, get your line weights where you want them, do your shading. You, you're not touching the liner anymore. Do the shading, do the color. Tattoo is finished. If you missed a step, too bad. It's over now. You know that that was a. It was so structured in the way that I was taught that it left me, like it, like you said, almost always in kind of a panic mode, afraid that my lines weren't good enough when I started my shading, and feeling like I didn't have the option to move backwards. And whenever you, when I found people taking a more a, a looser and more painterly approach, it like even though I didn't know how to do it, it made me feel it took took a weight off of my chest. You know. Yeah, it's awfully. I I. I can definitely um, agree with that where it, it kind of feels dogmatic, I suppose, like it's it's a little bit too rigid. And yeah, I, I really appreciated this, this looser approach that uh, it, it seems as if it almost wants to take like random circumstances into the into the mix a little bit more. It, 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 um, it encourages spontaneity, I feel a little bit more. And at, at the end of the day, whether, you know, you do a really traditional tattoo or you do a super illustrative tattoo, like you know we're all gonna die and all those tattoos are gonna disintegrate <laughs> they're they're not that different from each other than than or at least i am starting to think that they're not as different perhaps as i i would have thought they were when i first started um and and just to that point where you're you're mentioning um 
like, you know, Mark Rothko and, and a lot of these abstract painters. You know, I was kind of catching up on uh, some of the episodes of, of your podcast kind of leading up to this. And I was really happy to listen to the Nico Hurtado one where, you know, he's talking about having an appreciation for Rothko and a lot of those guys that, that are, you know, purely using color to, uh, to spark an emotion. And, you know, there you have, you know, a guy on like the Mount Rushmore of realism, at least to me. And, you know, he's he's looking at the complete opposite direction and that he sees something of value in there. So there's I, I just find it really cool. You, you can find value in everything. I suppose mm-hmm. if you just take the time to look at it. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I've forgotten that he had said that. But yeah, I remember I remember that now. I was surprised. Yeah. I was surprised to hear some yeah. of his uh, some of his influences. I even the even the um, is it Drew Shruzen? Is that the name? Uh, he, you know, I even whenever he mentioned that he was looking at poster art, I was and I thought, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. But it's never occurred to me seeing his work for all these years that 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 he was influenced by poster art until he said it. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't have imagined that either. Um, yeah. That that was a that was a big surprise to me. Like, hearing names like Drew Struzan, or uh, who's the guy that made Dinotopia? Uh, James Gurney. James Gurney. That yeah. book's that book's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, you got that book? Yeah, the uh, Color and Light. Is it? Yeah, I don't have Dinotopia, but I have his instructional. The Color and Light book is fantastic. Yeah. 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 I never even really I did I, I didn't know the Dinotopia series that well and I don't know if it's a single book or if it's a series of graphic novels or what I'm really not sure. I don't know. It's yeah. like Land Before Time for adults maybe. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um yeah. so uh you know before I I, I kind of had uh perhaps a set of stories that I was um hoping to share today. Um just because uh, you know perhaps uh you know, I can I can just kind of reiterate some of the the things I said to you when I first reached out about you know looking to potentially be on one day. Is um, okay. Well, first things first. I'm going to give a disclaimer. I'm not here to suggest that I have the answers to anything. I'm I'm a I'm a work in progress, and there's to me there's nothing that's more annoying that's that you know than someone that says like this is the way this is the path. So rather than share opinions. Um, I was hoping to share a set of stories uh, or, or a set of events, and then you can draw whatever conclusions you know you, you kind of want from them. And maybe they're completely dismissive, or you know they don't uh, they they're, they aren't going to relate to perhaps your particular set of circumstances. But you know these these are uh, perhaps moments or snapshots that gave me an alternative perspective to consider and, and, and helped me mature as a person, mature as an artist. And I'm hoping that perhaps it can, it can do the same. Um, and like last time, you know, the first thing I want to do was to, was to thank yourself, uh, for, you know, all the, the hard work that you've put into Fireside Podcast, uh, you know, over the last 10 years, I, you know, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of a lot of fans of the show, um, you know, at least here in Toronto that I've spoken to in person. Um, you know, not everybody, as you're aware, has like access to a, you know, a great apprenticeship or a great mentor. I thankfully did. However, um, there's always these extra tools that you, that you kind of end up, uh, relying on, uh, throughout your career. And, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, really proud to, to say that, you know, I get to kind of participate in a, in a podcast that when I was an apprentice was one of the the best ways for me to learn knowledge. And I'm not talking about, you know, only machines, but I'm talking about perspectives and the perspectives that might be required in order for you to kind of go out and, and do what you want with your life, right? Um, you know, whether it's listening to, you know, Gogwe or Fibs, like those those two alone were, you know, fantastic uh, episodes to listen to. And um, in your podcast with Gogwe, you talk about uh, the impact that Surrender had on yourself and you know jeff you know is kind of just really quickly highlighting that you know i went to japan and i you know i i did this film and um you know i had all these experiences from getting tattooed and i kind of want to you know spread that energy outwards and you know i can see that energy then having been transferred to yourself and then yourself you're transferring that energy back out to other people such as myself and now it's my turn to do that (laughs) to the the next round of people yeah, yeah, that's a great way to look at it. Yeah, yeah. I, I I appreciate that. This the, this show has um, I would have never guessed starting this thing ten years ago what the impact that it would have on me and and on 
you know, every, every, so many people that I come in contact with, I just thought I'd sit down with my friends and we would do shop talk, you know, and then just, we would, you know, just my old buddy David and I would just sit and talk in the back room. And then, and then we did kind of, one day kind of had a spark, like we should take this on the road. We're, we're tattooing at the convention anyways. Let's just bring our setup and mm-hmm. let's just ask people if they want to come on. And it was a complete afterthought. And I look back at it now and I'm like, man, th- this show has completely changed my outlook on so many aspects of art tattooing life i've I've crossed so so many paths and now you know it's like it's like when you if you're like a a a reader or you listen to a lot of podcasts i listen to a lot of audiobooks and you don't really know where you got most of what you got you have all these little pieces that, that have like all kind of uh coagulated together to 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 kind of form who you are 10 years later that's how i feel about that show i'm like you know i don't know who said this but this has always stuck with me. And it's like, I don't even know that they really said it like that. It's just the way that I interpreted it. And now it's a part of who I am, you know? Yeah. So. And it ends up being a story you tell people. And... <laughs> right. So I, perhaps the, 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 uh, the most natural way for me to kind of get onto these is to start describing what my, my, what my mentor was like. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I still very res- like distinctively remember the day that I met my mentor, Tony. Um, to anybody that's listening to this that knows Tony, they will understand when I say that he is a, a magical person that is difficult to describe in a few sentences. I'm, you know, I'm sure you've met other people in the industry that are kind of like that. They have like kind of an energy around them that uh, is hard to put into words. But I remember he, I was sitting at the, the drawing table right next to the, the uh, desk and he came in, you know, holding a you know, a MacBook, and he had a drawing book, and he was wearing a dress shirt with a a sweater tied around it. He looked like he had just come off a yacht. Uh, and he came up to me, and he he was incredibly polite. He's like, "Oh, you must be Mr. O'Neill. I've I've heard a lot of great things about you. Um, you know, it's a pleasure to have you here. And you know, here I am, someone who just a few days earlier had like an interview, and I'm just a, a dork from art school. And meanwhile, this established artist who's you know very well dressed very well put together uh comes over and and you know he looks at me in the eyes and and he 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 treats me as an equal like right from the beginning um and it it made such a strong impression on me um and it was the start of an amazing five years of you know working closely with someone who uh and 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 i hope you know this this doesn't uh you know come across as, as an insult Um, I I think it's actually the best thing about my apprenticeship was that very little of it had to do with art. Very little of it. I would say 5% of it was, you know, teaching me about shape design, whereas 95% of his focus uh, with, you know, any of his his, uh, pupils or uh, students, whatever you kind of, or apprentices, whatever, you you know, you want to kind of call them, is I think Tony has a, a belief in trying to, personally grow like try to try to uh grow as a person with the assumption that uh, with that will come professional growth as well and it's it's offered me an, an an opportunity to look at tattooing as a means to become a more mature responsible person a better communicator um, and someone who's less afraid and someone who's willing to take on more risks um, it makes me it's helped me become a more empathetic person. Again, that being said, I'm not perfect at any of those things, but um, it it showed me that there was a lot more to what tattooing can be than just you know making a quick buck, securing a down payment for some property, or you know having a reason to travel and go party. It could be so much more than that, which which was pretty awesome. Hmm. Yeah. Do you know his? Uh, background whether, whether it's his apprenticeship his drawing background his upbringing what like how he kind of came to that model of apprenticeship um i i only have suspicions um you know even though i was i was pretty close to him uh he does he does keep some parts of his life uh, uh a little bit more mysterious i'd say that's some of the charm to it mm-hmm. um but from my understanding he had gone to sheridan for animation and this is before sheridan themselves had kind of um accepted the fact that digital animation was going to be like the main thing going forward so he was doing physical drawing animation and uh, I I suppose at a certain point he may have had the same struggles I did realize that this isn't something that I I really kind of want to go down on Uh, so 
he realized that tattooing might be an alternative uh, option for him. From my understanding, his his mentorship he he had briefly gone back to uh, to China uh, to to try to study with someone, and I think some of the the negative aspects of that experience ended up informing what he wanted to be as a mentor. Somehow, like you know, you'll you'll hear some some people say like you know my dad treated me like this. So I'm going to want to be the exact opposite for, for my children. And, and uh, so a suspicion of mine is that his negative experiences ended up informing, you know, the, the, the incredibly generous and kind man that he is. Mm. Yeah. Okay. We had, in, in our kind of first talk, where we just were just getting to know each other a little bit, you spoke a little bit about um, negative experiences in, I want to say that it was in kind of maybe in getting tattooed or maybe uh, I don't think it was negative experiences with guest spotting with traveling and things like that, yeah. but maybe it was, is that, um, do you want to speak to any of that or is that out of context from where we're going? No, right no, that's fair. That's fair. We can, we can talk about that. Um, I mean, my experiences getting tattooed and, and traveling have, have been incredibly informative to my, to my practice as an artist. And, and uh, I believe that, you know, the service that you give to your client is is equally as important as to the tattoo that you give. You shouldn't use, um, like, your educational training as a crutch to, to, you know, not follow up with good communication and being attentive and making sure the, the mood of the room is right, making sure that they're comfortable and that they feel uh, acknowledged and respected. Um, no amount of, um, you know, good shading or clean line work or awesome color packing kind of compensates for, you know, being rude. Um, and so, you know, in, in my own case, uh, you know, getting tattooed and, you know, that I'll call them negative tattoos, uh, or negative experiences getting tattoos. And those are incredibly informative to my process where they, they kind of more or less create the, the roadmap as to what to avoid. Um, I remember, you know, my first, uh, my first tattoo, the guy canceled on me like two or three times in a row and. And I remember thinking, and then the last time that I finally did show up, it was a double booking. And, you know, I remember for a while thinking to myself, like, oh, my God, ta- like, why are tattoo artists so unorganized? They like, seem to be the, the most unorganized people on the planet. But, you know, that was yeah. because it was one of the few experiences that I had. Um, or as I've had a, other experiences where, like, an artist will be, like, two or three hours late. Uh, and, you know, then I... I then they tell me, oh, sorry, I was at a, I was at the, I was too busy at the Rolex dealership. I had to go buy a bunch of Rolexes, <laughs> things like that, or okay. not having an idea as to what you're getting tattooed that day. Um, I, I, I suppose uh, how I can summarize many of those experiences is just that I felt like I was the middleman between the artist and my wallet, hmm. if that makes any sense. Like I, I, you know, whereas the great experiences that I've had have, um, have been about you know, two people, or, you know, maybe you have a friend or there might be another person in the room, but two people sharing an incredible experience and incredible memories. I think like those are, those are the, the core of every single positive tattoo experience that I've had. And for that reason, that's kind of what I want to offer to my clients as well. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that, um, to, to reinforce that idea, I meet a lot of people who or you know, maybe I'm tattooing people who already have, you know, several tattoos or, are heavily tattooed and their favorite tattoos are rarely what I would consider their best tattoos. You know, they, it was their favorite tattoos are tied to the experience with the artist or the, um, you know, that it's, it's always the story of the tattoo more than the, you know, more than the tattoo itself. And you find that pretty regularly, I think with, you know, with people who really love a particular tattoo that may not be anything to write home about. Yep. No, abs- absolutely. So, um, just on that note, I'll want to speak about what was probably the most positive experience I've had in my career. And um, so the moment I'm, I'm getting my, uh, my full chest and leg uh, tattooed by Callie Corson in Sweden. Um, and he, he provided what I think was like the, the best possible experience that I could have imagined getting tattooed. Um, the first session you know, was, was really fun, but it was the second session where we were lining my leg, which kind of really sticks out in my mind as, as having taught me a lot. And I'm sure yourself and like, you know, your audience will, will kind of agree with this is that it doesn't matter how many times you get tattooed, you're always nervous before a session, especially, you know, a large, you know, a really long session where you're expecting a lot of work to be done. It's terrifying. There's no way around it. And, and 
if you know if you guys think that tattoo artists are are tough when they get tattooed no we're not tough i think we're probably the opposite a lot of the times um but i'd flown to sweden and uh we were going to be lining my leg that day and you know you book the flights you're you're excited to get to this new country but when it you know comes time knowing like oh man tomorrow i'm in for like you know four or five hours of rough line work on my knee ditch um you, you get the butterflies by the time that you get there and you know i'm not sure if Callie could sense that energy and and he kind of want to try some new tools to kind of calm me down or or perhaps this is just regularly how generous he is but instead of just getting right to work you know he showed me around the studio he explained what you know a couple of the like the little trinkets were on the wall he he really made the space feel lived in and it, it kind of helped you pay better attention to what you're seeing on the walls and it it uh gave you a moment to appreciate just the space alone and then he said you know what, let's go for let's go for some lunch so we you know we're walking down the street and he's saying ah you know my dad used to live in that apartment just over there and, and i also remember he was like in that one there was like a double homicide <laughs> like back in the 90s and we just went for you know some uh some lunch we had some burgers and then by the time that we got back to the studio and we were we were ready to start again i was completely relaxed you know, I'd settled into the space. I'd settled into, you know, working with his dynamic. And it was it was one of the easiest sessions I've ever had. Um, and uh, not, so to add to what you're saying as to, you know, we're, we're left with, you know, great memories of that tattoo. We're, we're also left with a uh, with a less painful tattoo, perhaps. I'm not sure if you're, if you're more comfortable, right? Yeah. 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 Have you you've I know you've you've done some some guest spots as well and you talked about going and working with Gogway uh for a while do you do you find yourself paying attention to that aspect of it a lot like how people are interacting and during their consultations or obviously we're paying attention to the studio when we're working in it for days on end you know just to kind of get a feel for what the the place is about but um I find myself constantly trying to eavesdrop on and and see what I can pick up from other people during their consultations even though it's none of my business yes that's very interesting. And, and I want to maybe uh, split those into two separate points. Observing how other studios work and observing how consultation works, I think, are equally uh, interesting topics there. Um, you know, earlier you spoke about how you were rendered uncomfortable, how there seemed to be like a sort of really rigid uh, dogmatic approach to how a tattoo is made. I think that you can also apply that concept to, you know, what kind of experience do you want to give to someone? Right. And, you know, going to do guest spots tells you, oh, I, I noticed that, you know, they just play really soft music and, you know, they get they they give complimentary uh, uh, bathrobes to their clients. Um, and in this particular studio, you can't just, you know, walk into the, the booths and go see what's going on. Um, there's completely different sets of values. And you'll also see managers occupying different roles where in one particular guest spot, you know, the manager, part of their, uh, I suppose you might say, responsibilities or roles in the studio is to just go around lighting incense. Um, and tattooing doesn't need to just be one thing. Whoever it was that maybe like you kind of encountered when you started in the industry and their their views on it, there are more than there are more ways that you can deliver a tattoo and there's uh, more ways to honor your clients than just perhaps their perspective. And ultimately, it, it encourages you to go out and seek whatever is best for you that allows you to be a more honest person and deliver a more honest experience uh, to your patrons. Um, as for cluing in on, on the, the consultation process, I find that equally fascinating because some people are just like straight down to business. Like, what do you want? Uh, you know, where do you want on your body? Uh, other people, they have a very different process of like establishing boundaries at the beginning with their clients and like establishing expectations with their clients. Um, other people such as myself, like my consultations are about like an hour to two hours long um, where I, I genuinely want to get to, to know the person for, for a couple different reasons. Uh, first is um, I, I, I want to get a sense as to like, what are the emotions behind your, your incentive of getting tattooed? Like what's kind of bringing you to this place? Like just, I'll give a quick example. Like if you're telling me that you want a dragon uh, and, and I ask you, why, why do you want to get a dragon? And you say, ah, cause I think it looks cool. Um, I found so often that when prompted, uh, you know, a, a patron of mine might, uh, 
if they if they do a little bit more thinking about it, they might come to realize that there's a re like there's a there's an emotional reason why they're willing to spend you know thousands of dollars. They're willing to travel to get a piece. It's permanent. It's painful. Um, it, it's usually something much stronger than it just looking cool. If that makes any sense. Um, and second of all, like just very practically speaking, you want to see if like your your personalities work well together. Because you know if you're working on a back piece with someone, it's like I'm going to be working with you for a year, and I understand that there's there's a transactional aspect in terms of you know money being exchanged, but at the end of the day, like we both have a lot of responsibility in this process. And is this someone that I can give a hundred percent of myself to this process? Not because there's money involved, but because there's 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 a lot of trust involved. Um, so so yeah, I think see, you know seeing how there's so many different ways to you know even do consultations or deposit structures or you know ways that you want to cash your clients out, whether it's at the beginning or the end of the day. Um, I think, like you said, keeping an open ear, uh, it, it really helps encourage you that there's, well, for one, there's so many different ways you can do it. So find the way that allows you to be honest to yourself and to give the best experience that you can, because you know that you're happy. Um, but it also helps you establish better boundaries with clients, set better expectations. There's so many benefits to just keeping an open ear. Mm -hmm. And, and, and even educate, because that story is a perfect example of the person you know, wants the dragon because they think it looks cool. And, and, and you say, well, you know, you're, you're investing a lot of time and money and it is painful. And, and I think sometimes there's, <clears throat> excuse me, a deeper reason that they, that they want it and you get to explore that together. Sometimes they honestly just didn't think that far ahead. Yep. You know, they don't really know that it's, you know, $10,000. They don't really know that it's, you know, eight hours of, you know, pretty intense, you know, uh, experience, they kind of, they discounted all that because they're picturing the end of the process a lot of times. And so that conversation is pretty important just to get on the same page, you know, in the case that they really haven't thought it that far through, especially if they've never had a large piece done before. Yeah. You know? And where, where my process sits at the moment, but I'm, I'm sure it's going to keep changing is, um, I usually send a, a pretty long email explaining, you know, like what my rates are, um, well, and, uh, but, you know, just kind of the, the, the basic stuff saying this is how far I'm booked out for, uh, you know, send me reference images. But the most useful part of my process is I send them a link to Surrender by Jeff Gogoy. It's, uh, I, 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 this is going to be a strong word, but I almost want to say it's mandatory viewing. Um, and the, the reason being is I think that that documentary... Uh, you know, you, earlier you spoke to, um, you know, calling particular moments in your career that changed your perspective, um, you know, in a, in a permanent sense or like really left, you know, an imprint on you was the moment that I understood the whole point of that documentary. The first time I saw Surrender, I, I, it was totally lost on me. I walked away thinking it was the most pretentious piece of of video media I've, I've seen in a long time. I was like, you know, this guy, and you know, mind you, Gogwe at that time was one of my favorite artists, but at the time I, I was mistaken to think like, he's telling you to sh like, shut up, don't make a sound, you know, pay me money. I don't know how long this is gonna take and let me draw whatever I want. That was very foolishly how I had initially kind of taken the, in that uh, that documentary, but it, it, it planted a seed into my head, which, you know, took took a couple months or perhaps a couple of years to germinate, and, and still now I'm kind of like un unwrapping, you know, the uh, the messages that are in it. Every time that I, you know, I I might happen to catch a clip of it, I look at it in a completely different way, um, and it it really started making me better appreciate the um, the exchange of of energy between two individuals and uh, how it's it's there's a lot of value in, in, you know, being patient and in kind of leaving your mind open to, to creative possibilities instead of like, again, thinking that a very specific thing is, you know, is going to happen. Like my, I know that my back piece is going to look this way. Whereas, you know, Gogwe is saying like, you know, the artist doesn't know what your back piece is going to look like. I don't know what the back piece is going to look like. Let's just leave it to, to chance almost. Let's just leave it to what life has to give us, I suppose. Yeah. 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 I would, I'd like to go back and, and, and watch. I haven't seen Surrender in years now. I'd like to go back and watch it again. What do you think, what made you watch it a second time? Or what, what like, if, if, if your initial reaction was, you know, this is 
pretentious. Uh, what was what do you think the seed was that made you go back and look at it a second time? Um, I think because at the heart of of that experience, like he's talking about getting tattooed as a tattoo artist, and so he's he's at the center of 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 so many different experiences. Um, and you know, at that point in my career, like I was getting tattooed, you know, I, and you know, when I was a, a younger client, I would try to assert a lot of, uh, control over the design. Like I remember when I was like 19 or 20, uh, I was getting tattooed and I wanted things in a very specific way. And, you know, the artists that I were going to, I, I wasn't doing enough research. I was kind of just like settling for average artists, but I thought that they were the best. And, and so I went in with a very sort of like combative approach thinking that I knew better somehow because I was an artist, uh, you know, and, and whereas I think like the best experiences you can have is when you completely surrender to, you know, as the, as the video implies to other people. And I, it kind of made me think about the tattoos that I had on my body. And I, I saw that there was a direct correlation between the ones that I tried to exert the most control over also happened to be the worst ones on my body. The ones that I kind of was just like, I want a tiger, some psychedelic colors, do whatever you want. There was a purity in the work and there was an expression, there was, there was, there's an unmistakable energy in it that I think just as a natural consequence, you know, turns out to maybe be better work, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I think that any time as, you know, as someone who, uh, you know, has tattooed a lot of people and have been, uh, have experiences where people are completely open to my interpretation or people who have, even if it's a few very specific requirements, sometimes those specific requirements have me second guessing my own kind of process enough that I could see how the, the drawings and the tattoo itself end up looking, getting, getting stiff or kind of losing the my mark you know the thing that that kind of that feel like makes it mine uh you know something as simple as you know i i hate purple i don't want to use purple and then you know i put out purple because i'm using yellow and i need to neutralize it or something like that and then instantly they're like i don't are you where are you gonna put that purple i don't want purple and it's like well i promise i won't put a purple shirt on this thing but i need purple you know but that, even that like just that interaction you know it's like if, if you're paying that close of attention to every move that I make in the process, it's uh, it just it tightens tightens the artist up. I think. Well, I, I think my solution to that, um, and it's something that you touched upon earlier, which is the value of educating the client and the value of including the client in. Not, I, I don't want to say the the word I'm looking for isn't the creative process, but um, there's a documentary that I I don't know if it aired in the states called How It's Made, uh, and they just. They just show you how a basketball is made. Yeah, you know, from yeah, begin from beginning to that. end. That was a great show. Yeah, and it kind of gives you an appreciation for how traffic cones are made, uh, and it, it just kind of puts the focus on something that you otherwise wouldn't give value to, and and you're like, oh wow, that's really cool. And likewise, you know, part of the experience that I try to get to my patrons is, um, you know, I want to talk to them about composition. I want to talk to them about color because this is a this is merely a suspicion of mine. Uh, so, so, you know, tell, tell me if you, if you want to push back on this at all, but I think one of the most important things that we can do to, to help sustain this industry is, um, I believe that we need to educate the public to, you know, really deeply appreciate tattoos, perhaps the way that they might, uh, a film or some music where we're, we, I want to show them a little bit of what's kind of behind the scenes so that not only do they appreciate their own tattoo more, but ultimately they can appreciate someone else's tattoo more. We're not only looking at the dragon, but if I tell them that, you know, the, to me, the background is way harder than the main subject. Like if you're freehanding clouds on something and you're trying to make these, these abstract shapes look good, that's a lot harder than, you know, drawing a subject that you've done all so many times. And, you know, then I've seen those clients, you know, in a later session, they might go up to another client, and be like, "Oh my God, I love the water in your piece." And you know, you've you've given them something else to to appreciate and see in the art, and that can start off its own chain reactions, you know, kind of further further along the the process. So, uh, you know, just to to revisit the the idea of you know purple and like you know mixing colors, you know, a large part of my process is is telling them, you know, it's going to look weird for now, but this is the reason why. Um, and, you know, just bear with me by the end, it'll look cool. 
um, and they are completely cool with it because you know they they understand the theory or the concept, um, and you know they 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 trust you. I better I, I sense. Is, yeah. that's my suspicion. Yeah, I, I agree. I like that example of of pointing out something that's a challenge to you, like backgrounds uh, and 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 that impact the impact that might have on them because now they have some little piece of information, like a secret from the artist about what you know, like clouds are harder than dragons. <laughs> you yeah. know, and, and so. I was just looking through some of your um, uh, some of the kind of notes that you had sent her earlier, and I uh, I wonder if this fits along with it. But you you had made a note that said, "Don't take the moment for granted. Always act like you're on a guest spot." What is that? What do you mean? Ah, uh, yes. So, um, shortly after coming back out to from my guest spot um, at Gogways, uh, these were in like the the, the latter years of you know my uh, my studying under Tony. One day he kind of pulled me in the back and uh, he was just kind of chatting with me and just catching up. But he had also kind of delivered um, some constructive criticism. And he said, uh, you know, Patrick, you've been working here for, for, you know, many years, but don't take the space for granted. Um, don't take your time in the studio for granted. And my suggestion to you is to kind of pretend like you're on a guest spot because ask yourself, how did you behave when you were doing a guest spot? And, uh, you know, I, I kind of thought about that. I was like, yeah, that's true. Like when you're doing a guest spot and you're going in the back to maybe grab some supplies that they've offered to you, you're not going to, you're going to make sure that you close, you know, all the doors. You're going to make sure that, you know, if there's, you know, you've ran out of toilet paper, you're going to, you're always going to refill the toilet paper. You're, um, you know, I hate to admit this, but like you're, you're, you're kind of subconsciously trying to be your ideal self sometimes. Right. Uh, it's, it's. It's one of these, um, it's one of like the tragic flaws of, of, uh, of mankind, which is that the closer that we are to people, the more vulnerable, like the more, the less we try sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas like we, we really try to, you know, impress or have a good impression on people in, in the periphery and, you know, to, to that matter, like, you know, when you're going to do a guest spot, you're on your best behavior, but there's no reason why you shouldn't be on your best behavior, behavior every day. Like you should be bringing that energy back to the studio that you're regularly working at. Um, and, you know, it's been told to me by someone that, you know, 20% of the work that you do is the tattoos. 80% of the work is all the other stuff that goes behind it, including just how do you interact in the studio with people? Mm -hmm. It's a large part of it. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of times whenever I, when I have new clients in, and maybe we're still trying to kind of feeling each other out. I, I want to be as like um, inviting and make them feel as comfortable and as at home as I can. So I just, a lot of times I just visualize my regular clients, the people that I tattoo every six weeks, you know, for, you know, maybe months and years on end now. And I just try to think about like when that person walks in, how do I, what are the questions that I ask? You know, what's going on? You know, how was work this week or you know, what did you bring for lunch or whatever, you know, like just really common, like every, you know, just disarming kind of uh, questions. Like we've known each other for years. So yeah. I try to treat brand new people the, you know, the same way by just kind of like switching their faces out in my mind, you know. It's kind of interesting you you mentioned that. I've noticed that I have um, not quite a similar process, but but something that might be uh, uh, kind of beside it laterally, which is... If I ever feel like there's there's a, a little bit of a mismatch in the energy between both people, um, what I might an exercise that I that I try to do is I try to learn from them. So if someone's like a I don't know like they're a, a, a hairdresser, right? Uh, I'm gonna you know I don't have hair, so maybe that's not the best example to ask them questions. But you know I might ask that hairdresser like how do you deal with clients that no show, right? Um, like, a, you know, a great example of this that we can refer back to tattooing. So I have a, you know, really awesome client um, named Hani, who's a who's a hairdresser. And, uh, you know, we came we come from very different backgrounds. But, you know, before our sessions, when we sit down just to enjoy a cup of tea, um, that's a moment where, you know, I'm I'm sitting across from someone that otherwise life never would have kind of paired the two of us up. And you're, you're kind of granted a precious moment to, to gain a perspective that otherwise you wouldn't. So, you know, I, I asked him, what's what's your solution for when you have a client that no shows? How do you how do you uh, address the problem? And he said, oh, he's like, oh, that's 
so so true this is happening to me right now where i have um you know someone that's no showed on me like three or four times and the way that i resolve that issue is you know i'll i'll reach out to them and say okay man i noticed that you know you haven't been making your last few appointments i kind of want to know what was up and uh you know he'll he'll or if it's really bad he might kind of just address it as um hey man like i'm I know that things are rough for you right now. It kind of seems like there might be some things kind of getting in the way, but you have to understand that from my perspective, you know, I need to know if you're coming in or not. And if, if you're not coming in, I'm losing out on money and I can't feed my family. So I think for now, we got to take a break from working with each other and, you know, you got to go, you know, figure out your stuff. And when you feel that you're ready and you feel like you're, you're, you're ready to, to, uh, you know, work with me again, um, I'll accept you with open arms. There's not going to be any judgment because, you know, you will have felt that you're ready to, to do this again. And, you know, I've never I've never considered approaching uh, a client conflict that way. And, and so yeah, I think that's another strategy as, as to how you can kind of like lighten the mood is see them as a potential teacher. Everyone's a potential teacher. And I think that once you once you ask someone a question about something that they're comfortable with, they're like, oh, wow, this artist is, is like asking me for my perspective and my advice and uh you know, it's, it, it, it I, I kind of get the sense that it, it helps, it helps them ease into the space, if that makes any sense, to know that yeah. they're valued. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I like that. I try to think about kind of meeting people where, where they are, instead of just assuming that I know why they did what they did, you know, trying to, uh, same thing, kind of, kind of trying to, to explore. I, I had what just last week, um, and it was not a no-show, but they had canceled two appointments in a row. And we had started an upper outer arm piece, kind of a Grim Reaper. And the idea, once we started the outer arm, we were doing the block-in session, and he mentioned that he wanted it to be, he wanted a full sleeve. And I said, oh, if we're going to do that, rather than finishing this piece, let me design the rest of it uh, so that I'm working as uh, working with the whole. And, um, and then he missed two appointments in a row, or canceled two appointments in a row. So when he finally came in this last week, I changed my mind. I said, well, how about since since you're having a hard time getting in here, um, why don't I just finish the outer arm piece? That way you're not walking around with an unfinished tattoo and then we'll deal with the rest whenever you have more time for it. And that opened up the conversation of why he was, you know, he's an air traffic controller. They're doing all this continuing education. It's a crazy, stressful job. Uh, that should be, you know, that, that educational component is wrapped up now. So he has three appointments in the next three months and he's ready to go. And, and so we're like, rather than just assuming that he was a bum and was like, couldn't keep up with his own schedule, you know, I, I tried to propose a different solution to the problem, you know, and, mm -hmm. then, he's, and then that opened up the conversation of, you know, what, what actually happened, you know, so. You know, I, I think that's uh, you know kind of meeting meeting people where they are and just and, and not assuming that you know why they're doing the things that they're doing is pretty important. Yeah, so that's a really good point. Um, yeah. That's that's definitely like you know being in the moment and and shows like the the value of patience and and empathy and compassion, which are all things that I need to get better at. So that's going to have to be something that I'm, that's, that's, that's great advice. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm seeing a handful of these uh, kind of uh, ideas that you laid out and you did a good job of, of like laying them out in a way where they make me curious, but I don't know what they're going to be about. So keep, that's keep right. going. <laughs> no, which, which one are you interested in? Um, well, one we may have just hit on is the, is the value of patience. So maybe we just talked a little bit about that, but you, you put value of patience sipping your coffee. Yes, that's that's an expression um, that again comes from surrender. Where you know Jeff talks about you don't have to just gulp your coffee on the way to work. Like you should kind of like learn to sip it. And I think like the the value of patience. You know, perhaps an, like an alternative title that uh, that I could offer to that is maybe just love life. Maybe that's what being patient can also be. It's just loving life. And tattooing has given me uh, and you know, uh, I should add, like, you know, an education in the arts has, has given me a sensitivity and an appreciation of things that, which otherwise I wouldn't have, you know, really, you know, liked. Great example, um, Japanese maples. I see a lot of tattoos that have Japanese maples, and yet I'm only seeing like one or two varieties of most of Japanese maples. Maybe the colors will be different, but for the most part, they're, they're relatively the same. Um, but if you actually look into Japanese maples, there are like 10 to 15 incredibly distinct varieties of them that, uh, you know, when, when, 
and this will kind of go back to like what's the what's the value of like a, a traditional art education where you're looking at form and structure is i'd happened to stumble across um it wasn't at all to do with the arts it was uh it was a gardening website talking about the the names of the different uh the, sorry the terms that are used to describe um a japanese maple when you're evaluating its shape and when you're trying to recognize it so I'm, i might be misnaming these but i remember the individual sort of guys that kind of come out they're referred to as fingers and they have a different term for like the negative space in between the individual fingers um, and they also talk about um, like the, the actual amount and the structure of them and when you apply this like through through a visual um, perspective you're really just looking at shape relationships and you're you're like oh my god there's nature's arranging all of these like incredible shape relationships in front of you to where you can you know you can walk down the street and you know before they're just a bunch of trees but all of a sudden you have a whole art gallery of shapes in front of you you know you can go up to to different trees and you can you can like look at you know is this one symmetrical is it asymmetrical oh i'm seeing a golden ratio and you know how these branches are formed um to you know now you want to throw in like i want to do like 20 different types of Japanese maples because it's uh, there's there's just so much to appreciate that's out there and and I mean just this morning right um, a, like a, an appreciation of being patient and slowing down is when I was arranging the tableau that you see behind me um, I'm sure that you know you're gonna kind of uh, you're you're gonna you're gonna maybe share the same experience is you got to figure out what to do with this big old head of yours in this shot. And you got to arrange this shape with all the shapes behind you. And you're, you know, I'm thinking like, oh, well, you know, this block in the frame is, you know, dark values. And this block in the frame is where I might put, throw some green in. Um, and, you know, just this morning, it really gave me like a, a deeper respect for just like streamers and vloggers and YouTubers. Like, yeah. They got to think about shape relationships too, just like us. Right. It's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah, that that's... Um... It, I think it's an important topic to touch on is just big, staying um, curious, you know, when it comes to like recognizing you know, what, what's happening when you're out, out on a walk, you know, the arrangement of shapes and in, in, in nature. So, so staying, staying curious and slowing down enough to, uh, you know, to, to actually notice those things. One thing that I find all the time, Memphis is a very green city. So we're, it, it's, we have, we're, it's basically a forest. We just live in like all these, all these huge trees everywhere. And, um, I, I, I find myself driving and mixing colors of, you know, subtle changes in the, you know, a tree that's just starting to green up versus one that's still completely brown versus one that's an evergreen. And, uh, and uh, I, do it sub, I do it subconsciously now. I think that I used to do it intentionally whenever I was trying to learn more, uh, you know, about, uh, but maybe when I was in art school trying to learn more about uh, mixing color. And now I just go like, what color, what, what would I start with? Which grid, would I even start with the green or would I start with, you know, uh, if I were mixing that, which direction would I tint it? And I, whenever you start to do those things, you'll continue to do them, I think, you know, and it's, uh, so your drive to work, you, know, you may not remember that you did it, but if you, if you think back, you're like, yeah, I just mixed colors in my head that whole drive. Yeah. yeah. Or my wife, you know, she, she tells me that, like last month, like, you know what, I think brown is the color that looks best on me. I said, well, why is it, why is brown the, the color that looks best on you? And then she'll bust out like makeup theory and she'll talk about like the width of her shoulders and you know, how like, you know, brown because it's a lower value has like a blockier sort of look on certain parts. And like, it's, it's just looking at, um, it's, it's, it's finding the beauty in everything and also finding systems that allow you to look at that beauty through a different lens, I suppose. Hey, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed part one. Part two of this interview will come out next Wednesday, next week. And uh, it's just as just as good. It really, uh, we share more analogies, more stories, and uh, we dive deeper into some topics that we didn't quite get into in this first segment. So be on the lookout for that. If you have ever thought while you're watching these interviews, like, man, I wish Jake would have gone deeper into that or asked more questions about that topic, or I wonder why he didn't ask about this topic at all. Um, I have a solution for you. You could join the Inside Fireside Tattoo Club where we do monthly technique talks. So you're basically sitting in on the podcast, on the Zoom call, and you're able to participate, ask questions, 
dive deeper into whatever topics that you like with our guests. They're really awesome. That's only one of the benefits, uh, one of the many benefits of being an Inside Fireside Tattoo Club member. Uh, I will link to the Tattoo Club uh, sales page just so you can kind of see what it's about. It's really cool. It's very inexpensive, 25 bucks a month if you pay monthly. Uh, if you pay annually, it's like 21 or $22 and well worth it. We do monthly drawing challenges, uh, prizes at the end of each month that are worth well more than your $25 a month uh, uh, payment. Uh, we really invest a lot back into this club. So the dues that you pay are put back into the club uh, to bring in guests, doing drawing nights. We do something really cool uh, that we've only been doing recently called um, a, a, a client role play night. So basically it's to help uh, tattooers to better engage with their clientele during consultations. And that's been a lot of fun. Uh, we've only done it two or three times, but it's been really cool. So yeah, check out Inside Fireside Tattoo Club. We'd love to hang out with you and do some drawing and stuff like that. I'll see you next week.